السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد uh, I was told before coming to the auditorium that this is not just your average auditorium this hall is actually a historic hall and I wasn't uh, aware of that apparently uh, in this very hall uh, President Abraham Lincoln spoke apparently on these very podiums. It's the same podiums he used. Uh, and this is a hall that is still used. Bill Clinton was here a few years ago. And two days ago, none other than Barack Hussein Obama <laughs> was here at this very podium giving a speech there. Um, so I think it's actually very appropriate, really and truly, it's, it's very uh, profound, if you like, that my talk which is entitled Islam in America, whither and where, is being given in such a location. Because the very reason why I'm talking about this talk, Islam in America, is that we as a Muslim community, until we understand where we came from and who we are, we won't have an identity, we won't have a vision. In order to situate ourselves, in order to contextualize the time and place we're in, we need to understand how and where and the, the, the mechanisms through which and by which Islam became such a dominant force in this country. And I think it is very profound, it's very symbolic, and actually makes me very uh, humbled and happy to know that this hall is so historic. And here we have, after having been filled with so many uh, other speakers, not that I'm worthy or not worthy of that, but the fact that we have a hall full of Muslims, now in America and I don't think ever that Abraham Lincoln or anybody could have ever visualized that there would be a hall full of bearded guys and niqabi or hijabi sisters you know sitting and talking where he's talking from and that is a profound point which we need to understand how did this happen where did this come from and what does that mean for us as an American Muslim community and so my talk today will be a summary of various tidbits and factions and talks and, and issues that you've heard, all of you. You've heard scattered throughout many talks, various articles. I'm trying to provide a holistic, simple, yet comprehensive history of how and why Islam is the force and is the, to the level and quantity it is today. In other words, what is the history of Islam in the North American sub, in the North American? When I say North America, I mean including Canada and including uh, Mexico, because again, these divisions are very new. In other words, they're only two, three hundred years old. Five hundred years ago, this was the entire uh, North American continent. So, how did Islam reach these lands, and what is the history of Muslims in these lands? And I'm going to divide my talk into various stages. The first stage pre-Columbus. We've all heard that there has been pre-Islam, sorry, pre, not pre-Islamic, pre-Columbus contact with America. Supposedly Muslims have been here, have, have been interacting with the native Indians, and no doubt that there are very good theories that, that, that uh, are given by very professional and academic uh, historians. But as Muslims, we need to be conscious what is fact and what is hypothesis and what is fiction. And the Muslim contact pre-Columbus as of yet is still hypothesis. It's not, un it's not established fact, nor is it fiction. It is a possibility and one that after an initial research that I've done, I think it is a very strong possibility, but it is still not fact. Recently, very recently, I think a few years ago even only, a Chinese document was discovered known as the Sung document that records the voyage of Muslim Chinese sailors. And as you know, Islam in China is another topic that is definitely worthy of our attention. Up to 10% of China's population is Muslim. 10%. That's a huge number. Millions, hundreds of millions, according to one estimate. So the Chinese Muslims, some of them they recorded chronologues, travelogues of their journeys and they talk about a land that they called Mulan Pi which some people assume to be America and that is a possibility. Also, there is much talk of the Islamic 
caliphate in the Senegalese and the Mali area, especially by Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa sent out an expedition which he headed and that was never heard of again. And it is rumored, and there are very, again, very strong uh, facts that still, you know, they cannot be said to be uh, solid, but there are very strong indications that Mansa Musa's expedition actually ended up somewhere in the uh, Caribbean. And he was shipwrecked there along with obviously his uh, followers. And of course they were all Muslim. And that had a profound impact. Many of the island's names over there, many of the uh, 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 linguistic formations of the language, many, even there are inscriptions that seem to be some type of Islamic res uh, uh, resemblance. All of this, again, as I said, are theories. And they're interesting. And I think we definitely need to research them more and more. In fact, according to one researcher at Harvard, there were even up and running madrasas, up and running madrasas, literally, in North America, in Arizona and other places. And that obviously is a very highly debated topic, but you need to know there are theories out there by non-Muslim researchers. There are uh, various uh, you know, papers, articles, books out there that you should, if you're interested in this top topic, read about, see who says what, and understand that there seems to be a very strong indication that indeed there was some type of Muslim contact. And this is shown by a number of things. Again, we don't have time to get into that. Not just inscriptions, but in fact, Islamic names found in pre-Columbus America. Names of, of, of North, Amer uh, Nor uh, North American Indian tribes using names that are clearly Islamic. Mecca, Medina, Ramadan. There are names that are recorded that have to have come from Islam. Yet where are the Muslims before Columbus? How do these people living in North America know of these Islamic terms? Obviously, if we do believe that some Muslims were shipwrecked or some other contact happened, it is possible that remnants of these Muslims remained, their legends became fables, and these things that they taught were incorporated into bits and pieces of native uh, Indian American folklore. But again, Allah Azza wa knows best. We cannot say for sure what exactly happened pre-Columbus. Just know that there are two primary expeditions, the Chinese one and the African one, both of which are assumed to have uh, or theorized to have landed somewhere in North America. The story of Columbus himself definitely is a starting point of some type of contact with the Islamic world. In other words, our contact, our meaning the Muslim identity's contact with North America is pretty much contemporaneous, it's pretty much related to Columbus's quote-unquote discovery of America. Of course, we don't call it a discovery anymore. He didn't discover anything. People were living here for thousands of years. He thought he discovered India, of course. So, Columbus shows you the status of India and the hearts of white men, but anyway. <laughs> It's just a joke, just a joke. Columbus, not many people realize, and this is not a theory, this is a fact. Columbus and the discovery of America has a lot to do with our identity, with us. How? Well, Columbus was in Spain, as you all know. And Columbus was financed by, who was he financed by? Ferdinand and Isabella. And Ferdinand and Isabella, they were the ones who destroyed the final remnants, the last bastion of Islam in Spain, the caliphate of Granada. Now, as you know, or maybe you should learn or study, the Spanish uh, Islamic experience was a very unique one. And I think Sheikh Anayas ibn Jas has talked about it or will talk about it. We'll talk about it. Uh, and inshallah, we'll talk about it a lot more at the Ilm Summit for those of you who are uh, able to inshallah come and, 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 and attend. The Islamic experience of Spain is something that's very unique. And we have a lot to learn from that. But to make a long story short, there were many caliphates simultaneously. And the last caliphate that remained was the caliphate of Granada. The Nasirid Kingdom of Granada. Stationed at Granada. Now, Columbus had gone to Ferdinand and Isabella many times. Two, three, four times following them in various cities, in Sevilla, in Qurtuba. He's going around where they're going and he's begging for money. Give me money to finance an expedition to India. And Ferdinand and Isabella kept on saying, we can't finance these fancy schemes of yours. Right now we're busy fighting the Moors, fighting these Muslims. We don't have money and we don't have political security to, to worry about these expeditions to India. Well, when did the kingdom of Granada fall? Which year? 1492. Which happens to coincide with what year? 
the year that Columbus set forth and discovered America, quote unquote, discovered America. The very reason being that the two are directly linked. When Ferdinand and Isabella finally managed to expel the last Muslim caliph from Granada, Columbus was actually physically present there. And he witnessed the Muslim king or the Muslim Khalifa having to physically beg and plead and hand over the keys of the city in a symbolic gesture. Uh, he handed over the key of the city to Ferdinand and said, here is the key, it's all yours. And Columbus witnessed this. He was there physically. And when the treasures of the Nasirid kingdom were opened up, obviously they are full of gold and silver and, and basically multi-million dollar acquisition by the newly formed kingdom of Ferdinand and Isabella. What are they going to do with all of this money? For the first time, they have the luxury of financing schemes here and there. And so, one of the things that they financed with the money taken from the Muslim Caliphate of Granada was the expedition of Columbus. And this is a historic fact. There's no like, you know, there's no conspiracy theories. And this is well known that only after they conquered the kingdoms of Granada, the kingdom, the Nasir Caliphate, were they able to finance Columbus. So Columbus had his money in hand. Two, three months after the fall of Granada, he gets his, his, his money. And he goes and hires out voyagers, seafaring men to go and discover this new land of India, the new route, the new road to India. He wants to now rediscover India through a different path that nobody uses. So he goes to a number of sailors. Of them, names that some of you have studied back in middle school and high school, so I don't expect you to remember them. Martin Alonso Pinzo and Vicente Yanez Pinzo, the captains of the Pinta and the Nina. The Pinzo brothers, P-I-N-Z-O-N. Now you read in some articles they were actually secret Muslims. This is a bit of an exaggeration, to be honest. We have to be fair. We have to be honest when we talk about academics. They were not, there were no indications of them being closet Muslims, as the term is these days. There are no indications of them being Muslim. But what is for sure the case is that they were descendants of Muslims who had been forced into Christianity. They were descendants, in fact, they were related to the Moroccan Sultanate of Abu Zayyan, Pizon, Abu Zayyan. Their name actually, the P-I-N-Z-O-N, actually comes from Abu Zayyan. And they were from originally a Muslim family who had been forced to convert to Christianity a few generations ago. And of course, at the time, Muslims were the ones who were well familiar with seafaring techniques, with navigating ships. They were the ones who were the experts in the field. And so Columbus hired them. And he set forth from the westernmost tip of Spain. And he stationed there, he stationed himself there for a number of months, planning and thinking about what to do and who to hire. And the place that he lived at in this westernmost region of Spain, it is a small little city called Larabida. Larabida. This city, Larabida, and the place where Columbus stayed, in fact, it is a obviously Muslim city, Arrabita, Arrabita, and again, this is well known. It's not something. The name of the city and the place was Arrabita, and the physical location where Columbus lived was a masjid that had been converted into a church. He lived in a church, a monastery, which originally had been a masjid, and from that location, he plotted and planned, he thought, he, months and months went by. And from there he then launched the voyage, that, the first of many voyages that were to discover, or quote unquote, discover uh, the land that we now call America. So relying upon Muslim money, using Muslim navigational techniques, when I say Muslim navigational techniques, I mean techniques that were devised and developed by people who were well known for this art and trade in Spain, they were the Muslims. Uh, living very literally in a masjid, literally an ex-masjid that had been converted to uh, a, a church and a monastery. And that is where he then set forth to discover the very lands that we now live in. So there are links and contacts. Now, as we said, there are claims that some of the people on the ship were Muslim. Again, I have researched this and we have to be careful as Muslims not to spout forth these theories that sound grandiose and turn, to, turn out to be false. We have to be factual. 
We don't know of any Muslim and it's highly doubtful, really and truly. It's highly doubtful that a Muslim was actually on uh, the ships with Columbus. But it is very likely, in fact it is historically true, that many of the descendants of Muslims, because Muslims had been, just like Jews, just like other religions, they had been forced to convert to Catholicism uh, centuries ago or generations ago. And a number of people, including the uh, Pizzo brothers, a number of them were in fact from these uh, converted, con uh, converted families. There are other early settlers and early um, explorers that we know to be Muslim. One of the earliest Muslims that we know, who died 1539, goes by the name of Estevanico. Estevanico. And his actual name was Mustafa al Zamuri. Mustafa. Mustafa al Zamuri. Mustafa al Zamuri, Estevanico was actually a Berber living in Morocco, North Africa. And he was one of the earliest explorers of the southwestern United States. He was captured as a slave. Now again, slave traders, primarily some of them Christian, some of them Arabs, they would go to various lands and capture people and make them into slaves. Literally, they would land the ship, they had guns, they had weaponry, they'd go and catch a number of people, throw them in the ship and take them away. And so Mustafa was one of these people. And he was forced to become a Christian by the Portuguese, transported to the Americas where he remained for many decades, becoming one of the uh, early uh, Muslim settlers, even though, of course, we don't know anything about his religion. Was he really and truly a Christian? Or did he pretend to be a Christian just to live? And obviously, as Muslims, we would all hope it was the second one, that he, he had to pretend to be a Christian to save his life. And we don't know much about him because of the early uh, time and frame that he was in. What we do know was that he was a medicine man of the time. In other words, he was a doctor. So the fact that second generation American Muslims all want to become doctors, there is a historical precedent in this a few generations ago. It runs in our blood. Another wave to the Americas was a group known as the Melungeons. Now the Melungeons are a highly problematic and controversial group. And to this day, nobody knows who they are. They're different from native Indians, they're different from African Americans, they're different from Caucasians. They are a different ethnic group that have been in America for 300, 400 years. Nobody knows where they originally came from. Obviously nobody knows for sure. There are many theories. Of the theories, and there's an entire book written on this, is that the Melungeons were a group of Spanish Christians who were forced to convert from their Muslim backgrounds and as a retaliation, to get out of that, they basically had to flee, and that was the first batch of Melungeons to America. Once again, this is a theory, and there's an entire book, again, written by a non-Muslim scholar about this issue. Again, Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Is this true or not? We don't know. But there is a theory that these Melungeons were originally uh, Christians who had been forced to convert to Christianity uh, because of the, 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 the Catholic uh, presence in Spain, and they fled it, and they came to Americas. These are the only people that we know of pre-Columbus. As you know, of course, within a few centuries, two, three centuries after that, primarily the British came and they took over most of the colonies and they decided to form an independent state and that becomes eventually the US of A. And when this happens, we have a number of tidbits here and there of the founding fathers and their views on Islam. We have various things that they've said about Islam which shows us really and truly that their vision of America was a very radically different version from the vision that some right-wing groups in North America of our times wish to posit in their mouths. In other words, their America truly was a tolerant America. That's the, what we get from what they said. George Washington, for example, the first synagogue opened in his time in North America. Of course, the Jewish presence was, is much better documented, and it goes back a lot more than we do for many reasons, obviously. That's, uh, I think it's common sense. Their relationship with Europe was stronger, hence their relationship to America became stronger as well. And so George Washington writes the first synagogue a letter congratulating them on opening their synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island in 1790. And he says, May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in the land, continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants. While everyone shall sit safely under his own vine and fig tree, there shall be none to make him afraid. So he's writing to the children of Abraham, 
Symbolically, of course, that includes us as well. And even though in this letter he, doesn't, he did not mention us, in another letter that he wrote, he declared that he would welcome Mohammedans, which is of course Muslims at the time, Mohammedans to Mount Vernon, which is where he lived, if they were good workmen, in other words, loyal citizens. He would have no problems welcoming even Mohammedans, even, at least like the last state, even Mohammedans would be welcome to come to Mount Vernon as long as they were good workmen. Thomas Jefferson, you can't get more patriotic than him. Thomas Jefferson, in his Bill of, of Religious Liberty that he had written for the state of Virginia, said, he, in that bill he said, the reason I've written this bill, it's meant to comprehend within the mantle of its protection, the Jew and the Gentile, the Christian and the Mohammedan, the Hindu and the infidel of every denomination. So it's quite clear that when he's writing his Bill of Religious Liberty, which is a bill that he wrote for the state of Virginia and not for the United States, but this is the same Thomas Jefferson when he was a senator, when he was writing uh, for the state of Virginia, the Constitution. One of the things that he wanted to make sure was there should be liberty for all people of all faiths. Again, we as Muslims need to recognize these things, understand them, and quote them back to the very people who claim to follow that tradition of thinking and yet in their actions are going against it. In 1790, the South Carolina legislative body granted special legal status to a community of Moroccans. The first indication that we have that there are Muslims living in America. 1790. Now these Moroccans, it's a long story and there are a number of articles written about them. These Moroccans were actually once again uh, forced Con not converts, but forced slaves. They were free men, free women, who had been forced to become slaves and eventually made their way to America. And they petitioned, as slaves, and they petitioned, and they petitioned the Congress, they petitioned the President that they should not be treated this way. And they said, we are not Caucasian and we are not African. We are a different group of people. We are the Moors. Therefore, in 1796, President John Adams signed a treaty called the Moore's Sundry Act, declaring that the United States, and this is the president of the time, John Adams, John Adams said that the United States had no character of enmity against the laws, religion, or tranquility of Musulman. He used the term Musulman, which is, of course, the time it was considered to be uh, a, a Persian term to describe the Muslims. Uh, of course, for us, most of us, we think of it in Urdu term, but it's actually a Persian term. So he said, the United States does not have any animosity towards the laws, the religion of Muslims. This is John Adams writing this. We also have bits and pieces of individual Muslims. Now, we have no indication of what happened to these Moroccans. Did they return? Were they freed? We don't know what happened to them. But for sure, Islam didn't survive uh, after them for too long. Other indications here and there that we have of immigrant Muslims. We're going to get to the slave experience in a while, in the next stage. Immigrant Muslims. One of the, the people who is quite well documented is a person by the name of Haji Ali. Haji Ali, his original name was Philip Tedro. Haji Ali was actually a Greek who was born in Constantinople, the Khilafa, as a Christian. And he converted to Islam over there before coming to America. So he was ethnically Greek, he looked Western, and yet he was a convert. And he had performed the Hajj, hence he becomes Haji. And he took the name Haji Ali. And in the middle of the 19th century, the American government decided to open up a special branch of the armed forces to deal with desert situations. And so they hired they purchased a number of camels from abroad, from Syria, from Egypt, and they hired a number of foreigners to take care of these camels. Camels are not a species that are indigenous to America. So they hired a number of people to take care of these camels. All of them were non-Muslim except for Haji Ali. Haji Ali was put in charge of them because of his experience. He was a person who took care of camels. And so he was, per he was hired as a caretaker for camels. And he became a U.S. citizen and he lived the rest of his life in America. Haji Ali, his name was too complicated. And so if you want to look him up, you'll have to look him up under High Jolly. High Jolly is what they used to call him. And to this day, he has a, the, the U.S. government honored him because of his services. 
And uh, to this day, there is a grave of his uh, with a pyramid and a camel on top. That's what they did when he died. Uh, there's a grave of his that is visited in a place called Quartzsite, Arizona. And I looked up the site, Quartzsite, Arizona, and they said his grave is the uh, number one tourist attraction of Quartzsite, Arizona. And I was wondering what other tourist attractions would possibly be there in Quartzsite, Arizona. But in any case, if you ever want to go to Quartzsite, Arizona, realize this is the number one tourist attraction, is the grave of High Jolly. <laughs> Haji Ali passed away in 1903 in Arizona where he died. And he was actually a imam over there for the newly founded immigrant community in Arizona. And his three daughters, his wife also converted, his three daughters were raised as Muslims. But we have no idea what happened to them or how much of an Islam remained with their family. Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We don't know. Let's move to another section now. And that section is the most well-documented and researched section. We can give many lectures just on that section. And that is a section of Islam amongst African-American slaves. Islam amongst slaves, as I said, is a separate topic in and of itself. We will never know for sure what percentage of these slaves were Muslims. We'll never know for sure. Some scholars have even estimated as many as 10% of the slaves that came in from Africa were Muslims. And you all know uh, the famous Kunta Kinte uh, and uh, the story roots of Alex Haley. I strongly encourage every single person who's interested in Islam in America and, and enthused about this to read this book. Roots by Alex Haley, it really and truly brings the point home in a far more eloquent way. Of course, they made a movie out of it, but as is always the case, the book is way above uh, any uh, movie indication of it. So, Islam was brought in literally with the, the advent of the slaves. And you have to realize, these slaves, who were they? They were Muslims who happened to wake up one day, go to their fields, and all of a sudden they get marauded by a band of, of white guys. They have no idea who they are. And next thing they know, they're in the middle of a ship being transported all the way across the world. So, Yarhamukum <laughs> Allah. So, many of these Muslims ended up in North America and really and truly they were uprooted, uplifted from each and every element of society that they had. What exacerbated the situation? is that Americans themselves had no idea of Islam at the time, most of them. They have no idea there's a religion called Islam, or how can you tell a Muslim from a Christian? They simply don't know. This is, we're talking about late 1700s, early 1800s, still very early on. So they take his slave, and he might be the only Muslim slave in the entire plantation. How do you expect him to preserve his religion? How do you expect him to pass it down? Obviously, they were not able to do so. Yet when you read the literature of the time, you find stories. Wallahi, the first time I read them, Wallahi, I cried. I cried because you feel the pain of these people. They are our Muslim brothers and sisters. And literally overnight, their whole world changes. And they're thrown into the most abject, cruel situation imaginable. Not that we don't feel pain for the others. Of course, we feel pain for all of them. But no doubt. Those whom we feel a connection, we feel their pain more. Not that we're trying to trivialize the rest of them. And especially you read some of their statements that they have, the tawakkul they have in Allah, and the iman that they display in this time of, of, of slavery. Uh, I want to give some examples. One, uh, one interesting book, by the way, is a book written by Charles Ball, who was an educated African-American slave. He wrote his autobiography in around 1850s. And he talks all about his life. He remained a Christian. But he wrote in 1836, he had the following to say, one paragraph in the book. I knew of several slaves who must have been from what I have since learned Mohammedans. I knew of people, I didn't know who they were back then. Now I know they were Muslims. Though at the time, I had never heard of the religion of Muhammad. There was a man on my plantation who prayed five times a day. This is in 1836, he's writing about an incident perhaps in the 1810s. Always turning to the east when in the performance of his prayer. You see this one paragraph in this book, it just opens up a whole chapter that perhaps we'll never be able to explore. I knew of several, in his lifetime, he met several Muslims 
Five, ten, twenty, we'll never know. He didn't know they were Muslims, but he met them. You still find other references. The single best reference that I strongly encourage you to get is the huge work, the original, if you can get it. Alan D. Austin. Alan D. Austin, he has a book, African Muslims in Antebellum America. African Muslims in Antebellum America. If you log on to Amazon, you'll see another book with the same title and the same author. That is the condensed and summarized version. Get that one because it has very good pictures in it. But the original, the original, I think, is his dissertation. And that's probably your library has it. I haven't found it being sold. I've been wanting to purchase this for a long time. The original is huge. The one on Amazon is like 150 pages. It's a summary of the work of his thesis and added other chapters and stories as well. In this book and other books, you hear of quite a few people. Quite a few people who were Muslims. He documents them. One of them, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq was his name. And he wrote his autobiography in Arabic, which is still available, in 1834. Very long, I can't quote all of it. Listen to this though, and this is the, the part really and truly it affected me when I read it for the first time. And I can only summarize it. The faith of our families is the faith of Islam. You, see, you sense the pride. This is what he's starting his, his autobiography with. This is who he is. I am a Muslim. The faith of our families is the faith of Islam. And then he describes how he got captured. That he was literally, as I said, walking along and a bunch of you know, guys comes and kidnaps him. And next thing he knows, he's in the, the, the blindfold thrown into a ship. And his arduous journey to America, etc., etc. He goes, that was the beginning of my slavery until this day. I tasted the bitterness of slavery from them i.e. the Christians, he's talking about the Christians, and its oppressiveness. But alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah, under whose power are all things. He does whatever He wills. No one can turn aside what He has decreed or ordained, nor can anyone withhold what He has given. As Allah Himself says, this is an American slave writing in America, in a manuscript that is still found in America, preserved in its original that He wrote in Arabic, which is his, He's writing to Himself. There is nobody else to communicate with. There are no other Muslims He can write to. He's writing this to Himself, and this comes, we come across it after He dies. We know what He says. Now we can read it. Back then, nobody knew Arabic. As Allah Azza wa Jal Himself says, and He's quoting the Qur'an from memory, He doesn't have a Qur'an. There are no Arabic books that He happened to take with Him the day of the journey. He's quoting the Qur'an from memory. As Allah says, قُلْ لَنْ يُصِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا هُوَ مَوْلَانَا وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ He quotes the verse in Surah At-Tawbah. Say, nothing can happen to us except whatever is written for us. Allah is our Lord, therefore in Allah, let all of us put our trust. Another very well-documented slave is Ayyub ibn Sulaiman. And he is probably the most well-documented slave of all. He was captured in Gambia in 1731, but because of his education, intelligence, wit, humor, he was able to earn his own freedom, he campaigned for his own release, Again, you have to realize, Muslims were highly educated. They knew how to read and write at a time when even their owners probably couldn't read and write. And so for them, this was something that this guy can't be a slave. You have to understand the racist mentality of America back then. These people, for them, were subhuman. To meet a person who can read and write, who can speak intelligently in their language or whatever, to quote scripture, this is something that is astonishing. So Ayyub ibn Sulaiman was one such person who was able to win his freedom, even go to meet the royal family in England. Again, this is before the found formation of America, 1731. He met King George II, and he finally returned to his native country. He had written three entire Qur'ans from memory. From his hiv, he had written three Qur'ans, which are still available here. And he's known, as I said, for his wit and intelligence. In England, when he's sitting down and he wants to be painted, Sorry, they asked him that we want to paint you. And we have a painting of his to this day, what he looked like. So they said, we want to paint you in your native dress. Do you have a native dress? He said, obviously not. I didn't take my suitcase the day you guys kidnapped me. I don't have my native dress. But why don't you just draw it? I'll describe it to you. I'll describe it to you and you draw me in my native dress. So they said, how can we draw you in a dress we've never seen? To which his reply immediately was, if you can't draw a dress you never saw, why you some of painters presume to draw God whom no one has ever seen? 
Subhanallah. It's powerful, isn't it? You can't even draw me in a garment I've never worn. And everywhere I go, I say pictures of your God. Who has seen God and yet you presume to draw images of him? So this is Ayyub ibn Suleyman and he returned to Gambia. And Allahu A'lam, what histories he left in Gambia. I really wish somebody could go and take up his story from there. Because from our standpoint now, he's cut off from our world. I have to go on quickly because time is running short. I have a lot more actually prepared. I have to summarize. Um, as I said, there were many people of them. Again, I want to mention a few. Of them, and then one of the most interesting is a slave by the name of Bilali Muhammad. Bilali Muhammad, who died in 1857 in Georgia. His master was a very tolerant master. Believe it or not, he actually, as a slave owner, he wanted to abolish slavery. And he was campaigning to abolish slavery. And at his death, he included in his will, all of the slaves and slaves should be set free. He purchased an original batch of slaves, not slaves who had been uh, you know, already working in America. He purchased an original batch, fresh off the boat, literally FOB, fresh off the boat. <laughs> he purchased a fresh batch of slaves, three, four hundred, and he took them to his plantation. And it turned out that the ship had come from perhaps Senegal, perhaps Gambia, so a good percentage of those slaves were actually Muslim. And because he was so tolerant and so liberal for the time, he actually allowed them to practice Islam on his plantation. And a good percentage of the current descendants of that region, it's, a, it's, it's called the uh, Sepelo Islands, the island which is right off the coast of Georgia. And this rich plantation owner owned the entire islands. So he had given, uh, he had purchased all of these slaves to basically take care of the island and, 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 and you know, get, the, get the cotton out and do all of that. He has an entire group of Muslim slaves. And this person, Bilali Muhammad, when he died, a little manuscript was discovered in his room, which he thought was his autobiography or something like that in Arabic. So he donated it to the museum. This manuscript turns out to be an original work of fiqh, detailing for the people of the island, the Muslims, their laws of the sharia, how to fast, how to pray, how to do wudu, etc., etc. And it is based primarily on the Risala of Abu Zayd al-Qairawani, but it is from his memory, modified for their situation. So this book is the first fiqh book written for Americans. This is the first fiqh manual for North America, written by Bilali Muhammad. Many of his descendants, great-great-great-grandchildren, they had memories of their ancestors. Not Bilali Muhammad, he's too far up. A researcher in the 1940s went to Sepelo Islands to do a lot of research about the people. Reason being, Sepelo Islands were kind of cut off from America. So what's happening there is, a, is like a, it's a window into the past. So in the 1940s, he goes there and he meets many of the African Americans living there, the majority of whom, or a huge percentage of whom, whose ancestors were actually Muslim. And he meets, and, and this is just amazing what he, what he comes across, Katie Brown talks about her own grandparents. So we're talking about the 1890s, 1880s. I wish I could have an uh, African-American accent here because the way it's written is exactly in the, uh, the way that they speak. They was very particular about the time they pray. It's exactly the way it says it in my uh, notes here. And they pray regularly about the hour. When the sun comes up, when it's above their heads, and when it sets, that's when they pray. This is a person speaking in 1940. 1940 when my father and perhaps many of your parents were alive. This African-American lady remembers her grandparents who were probably grandchildren of Bilali Muhammad. Islam was alive in their region, in America. Another person says, I remember Uncle Kalina and Auntie Hannah very well. They talk a lot of funny things and they mighty punctual about the prayer. They mighty punctual about the prayer. Shad Hall, another person, recalled, Hester and all of them on the plantation, they sure pray on the dot. They pray at sun up, they face the sun on the knees, and they bow down to it three times. So he thinks he's worshipping the sun, he doesn't realize. But they bow down to it three times, kneeling on a little mat. They have a sajada. They have a sajada, and this is in the 1880s, 1890s. Another old woman said, I remember my grandmother, she had a book she would read from. Now this book could not have been a book imported from Africa. 
This book is a book written from memory. And we can assume it is the Quran. And I remember we little children would laugh when she would say a certain word. All I remember of it was, Ashama Nagad. Ashhadu Anna Muhammad. That's my, my opinion. Ashana Magad. That's how she writes it. But Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. She is saying whenever she would say it, all of us little children would laugh. Again, this is a woman in the 1940s, an African American lady thinking of her grandparents. Now, I remind you, this is an exceptional case. The vast majority, Islam, their Islam had totally disappeared in the African experience. But it is no coincidence that Islam was resurrected in the African American experience because of these subconscious memories. We get to the modern era. And I have 10 minutes to go over 7 pages. Let's see what we can do. Do you guys allow me 5 more minutes a little bit? <laughs> Just give me a little bit more inshallah. This leads us roughly to the modern era, around the 1880s, 1890s, where we have the first documented case of converts to Islam. And amazingly, coincidentally, we have one African American and one Caucasian American. I don't have time to go into the stories, I'll give you their names, and there's lots of books written on them. The African American was a very famous author who had a profound impact on a number of people who would then take over the national civil rights movements. He was two generations before the civil rights movements, but his ideas had a profound impact on the civil rights movements two generations later. A person by the name of Edward Wilmot Blyden, B-L-Y-D-E-N. Edward Wilmot Blyden. And in 1889, he converted to Islam as an African American. And he immigrated to Liberia, Remember for that time, that was the free land for African Americans and he became the Minister of Islamic Education over there in Liberia. And he wrote many books. Of the books that he wrote, which is a very famous book, Christianity, Islam and the Negro Race. And his basic thesis in the book, which is available, is that Islam is a perfect, is a better, is a unifying religion for the African Americans and not Christianity. Similar, around the same time, in 1893, we have the first documented Caucasian convert to Islam, Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb. And of course, his story is very well documented. And an entire book was recently written, which was, I think, a PhD dissertation, if I'm not mistaken, but it is available on Amazon. Very well documented and researched book, uh, Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb. And uh, he passed away in 1916. And he founded one of the first Islamic organizations in America called the American Muslim Brotherhood in New York, right here. Uh, again, I have a lot here to say about him, but I'll have to skip that. I just leave it to you to look up the research on him. He even gave a lecture, which was attended by Mark Twain, about uh, Islam and the theology of Islam. So that's another chapter. We move on to the second to last chapter. The second to last chapter of my little talk here. The resurrection of Islam amongst African Americans. Now... We all know about the nation of Islam and, and, and the, 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 the role that it's played in introducing Islam to African Americans. The nation of Islam was initially started by a person by the name of Wallace D. Fard. Wallace Muhammad, Aywarith Muhammad of our times was named after Wallace D. Fard. Wallace D. Fard. This Wallace D. Fard, he was a clothing salesman. He traveled door to door in a predominantly black neighborhood of what is now Detroit, Michigan in the 1930s. Much has been theorized about Wallace D. Fard. Who was he? Where did he get his ideas from? However, one thing is known for sure. In 1920, 10 years before Fard, the first Qadiyani Muslim arrived in America. Dr. Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, Indian, origin, Qadiani, all you know Qadianis, heretic group, we don't consider them to be Muslims, they believe in Mirza Ghulam Ahmad to be a prophet after the Prophet ﷺ. He arrived in America to start spreading teachings of Qadianism. And he began writing pamphlets, letters, brochures, converting a lot of people to Qadianism, not to Islam. And he moved later to Chicago, where he founded the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Chicago. And it is no coincidence that the Nation of Islam's foundation and base also has a lot to do with Chicago. One of the people that he drew into his group, we're talking about Dr. Sadiq, the Indian, was an African-American by the name of Timothy Drew, 
who, who became, who called himself Noble Drew Ali. And he went on to found the first uniquely African-American quasi-Islamic group, the Moorish Science Temple of North America. This was an up and running religion for many decades. It still exists, I think there's still a temple somewhere in New Jersey, but it is now completely a defunct organization. He founded the first, if you like, inherently uh, American Islamic experience. Obviously for us looking at it now, and there's no doubt about it, it is kufr, there is no, it's nothing Islamic about it except a few names. And he has a book called the Quran, and he is from Mecca, and he's this and that. But the religion has nothing to do with Islam. But the idea has started. We need to form a new theology for the African Americans. Moving back to Wallace D. Fard. Wallace D. Fard began preaching a new theology. When the Qadianis are in the background, they're already here, they're up and running. Wallace D. Fard comes along, and he claims to have been born in Mecca, that he was taught that the white race had been uh, a scientific experiment you know, that was created by the black race by an evil scientist by the name of Yaqub, etc, etc. The same, now this theology is still the theology of the nation of Islam. Where did this guy get this from? Who is he? Wallace Tifard. What are his origins? To this day, we don't know for sure. But recently there was a very good book written uh, about the various Islamic movements and I, I read it cover to cover, it was very fascinating. Uh, and there's actually a picture of Wallace D. Farr because he was arrested twice for petty charges. So the, the, the police actually took a picture of him. We have a picture of him. It's actually available even online. And this researcher, very convincingly in my opinion, concluded that this person, Wallace D. Fard, he's actually from New Zealand, born to an Indian Qadiani, quote-unquote Muslim father, and a New Zealand mother. So his father is an Indian Qadiani. And his mother is Caucasian, white, New Zealand. And he came to America as an immigrant to work to get some money. And his features were neither white nor black. He's definitely not African American, but he's definitely not white either. If you look at his picture still, it's obvious. It's, it's something unique, ethnically different. And this explains it, that he's half Indian and half Caucasian. And this Qadiani, or so we think he's Qadiani, what proves he was Qadiani, by the way, as well, is that he would be seen worshipping in the Qadiani center of Chicago. He would go to the Qadiani masjid of Chicago. That was already up and running by the, uh, the, the Indian da'i that had been sent. This Qadiani began preaching this new teachings of prophethood and new prophets and new this and that. So Wallace D. Fard is the one who formed a basic vision. And one of his primary students, one of his primary students was... Elijah Poole, later to become Elijah Muhammad, the founder of the Nation of Islam. So Elijah Poole became attracted to him. Elijah Poole has a very uh, interesting story as well, drug addict and, and, and alcoholic, whatnot. His wife cleaned him up. His wife literally forced him to attend the, the lectures of this person, Wallace Defard, leave all of this stuff, get a job, this and that. So literally, Wallace Defard cleaned him out, made him a new person, transformed him. He owed his entire existence now to Wallace Defard. And Wallace Defard mysteriously disappears. We don't know what happened. Most likely it's a very innocent thing. He was arrested a second time and he was said he'd have to be deported. So he was deported back to New Zealand. But the last thing that he said in jail to Fard who had come to visit him, you're in charge. I can't do anything, I'm leaving. You're in charge of whatever I've started. So it was Elijah Poole who changed his name to Elijah Muhammad who then even took this theology to a new level. Elijah Poole, Elijah Muhammad was the first person to say Wallace D. Fard is God himself. He never said that. Wallace D. Fard, he was a Qadiani, he's quite messed up, but he's not that messed up, okay? <laughs> he's, he, he never claimed to be God. Elijah Muhammad said, this was God who had come. And obviously, if he's God and I spoke with him, what does that make Elijah Muhammad? The prophet of God. So I am the prophet, Elijah Muhammad says, I am the prophet and Fard Wallace D. Fard is the God who came down. Allah himself came down to earth. And the theology is the same. Black man is this, white man is that. And then he developed his own thinking, what not. And the rest, as you know, is indeed history. But the nation of Islam spread a pseudo-Islamic theology amongst African Americans. And you have to realize, and this is something I want to say very bluntly. I am an Aqidah teacher. I know Aqidah. I know Kufr. I know this is kufr, but we also have to understand that sometimes 
kufr leads to a good at the end. We're not justifying the kufr. It is kufr. But were it not for this perverted teaching of Islam, you wouldn't have the large segment of African American Muslims that we do. This pseudo-Islamic teachings actually made them enter into pseudo-Islam and then in the 60s, 70s, 80s, alhamdulillah, the majority of them entered into Orthodox Islam. If this pseudo-Islam had not existed, they would not have been Orthodox Muslim. I'm not justifying it, I'm just stating a historical reality. And that is something we need to understand. Elijah Muhammad, as you know, uh, he never really changed his theology. Uh, famous people converted, obviously the most famous, Muhammad Ali, who is still uh, alive today. This person is a living legend in every sense of the term, including for the history of Islam in America. He made the name Muhammad a household name. That's a very positive thing. Okay, Every household in America now knows the name Muhammad because of Muhammad Ali. Uh, this is a very positive thing. Okay, Other famous converts, as you all know, Malcolm X, Karim Abdul-Jabbar, they all converted to the nation of Islam. Eventually, all of them left it to orthodoxy. Elijah Muhammad sent some of his sons to Azhar. He had plenty of sons, legitimate and illegitimate, as we all know. He sends his sons to Azhar. His son, the oldest one, I forgot his name now. Um, does anybody remember his name? Herbert, the oldest one, when he studies at Azhar, Akbar, sorry, it's Akbar, it's not Herbert, it's Akbar. Akbar went to Azhar, and when he studies with Muslims, all of a sudden he realizes, something's wrong with my father's teachings. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. And so Akbar comes back and he starts giving some hints and indications, this is not Islam, what we, what we believe in. This is not Islam. And bit by bit, orthodox Islam comes in and in and in. And Wadithin Muhammad, the present leader of uh, the, most of the African American brothers of ours, Wadithin Muhammad was one of those people who opposed his own father. And at the death of his father in 1975, within three years, he had disbanded the NOI, abolished it, and said there is no prophet after the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. there is no theology of blacks being created by whites, etc. All of this is abolished. I want to say again something very blunt. It's going to get me into trouble, but it needs to be said. Many of us immigrant second generation Muslims, we really and truly look down at some of these people. We criticize them in their theological positions. Sometimes with merit. Sometimes with merit. Yes, it is true. Some of what certain people say is wrong from a pure orthodoxy. But we need to see what Wadithin Muhammad did. He took his people out of blatant kufr. And he entered them into Islam. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah, anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Even if we disagree, I disagree with some of the minutiae, some of which are not minutiae, some of them are major things of fiqh, major things of methodology. I disagree with Wadidin Muhammad in certain things, but I respect and admire what he's done. The courage that he must have had to stand up and oppose the teachings of his own father, to divert his people from some perverted version of Islam to some orthodox version, some orthodox. It might not be as orthodox as we would like it to be. Some of us here, true, agreed, but it is still Islam, alhamdulillah. It believes in the same pillars, worships Allah, not Fard Muhammad, prays Mecca, fast in Ramadan, and not in December. These are changes that Wadatin Muhammad brought about. I think we immigrants need to get over this mentality of being so overly critical of people without realizing where they came from, what they did. And that's something that needs to be said. It's time has come for us to talk so boldly and so bluntly about these issues. We need to tackle these issues head on and say, yes, I respectfully disagree with some of the teachings of some of the people involved with the movement of Wadatin, but I still give him a lot of credit and respect. Immense credit and respect. The fact that where he was and where he is now, that is something we Muslims need to appreciate and understand. So, of course, the best book on this, the single best book on this, there's no, no holes barred, is the book by a leading African-American intellectual. All of you should be familiar with him. Dr. Abdul Hakim Jackson, Dr. Sherman Jackson. Uh, he has written a book, Islam and the Third Resurrection. Um, sorry. Islam and the Black American, the Third Resurrection. Uh, that's something that definitely you should read as well. It's a very fascinating book uh, by Dr. Abdul Hakim Jackson. The final chapter. Inshallah, just a few minutes left. The final chapter. Most of us sitting here, where did we come from? Here I get to the immigrants. What happened to them? Very quickly. In the 19th century, there were no immigration laws in America. If you landed in America, you had to pay a hefty 50 cents to become a citizen. Tell your relatives back home this. 
All you had to do was pay a little bit of a fee and become an American. The whole country is empty. So a number of Muslim communities started forming. In 1897, the government allocated free land in certain areas that were uninhabited. So a number of Syrians uh, went to North Dakota. Obviously, that's where the free land is being found. And quite a number of them obviously were Muslim. Many were Christian, many were Druze. In 1899, a very famous Muslim activist by the name of Hassan Jum'ah settled in North Dakota and he became the leader of a community of Muslims, over 20 or 30 Muslim families. In the 1920s, they built one of the first mosques in Islam, uh, uh, in, in America, in North Dakota. In 1908, a number of Arabs uh, and, and others arrived from the Ottoman Empire, Syrians, Lebanese, Jordanians, and they built some masjids. They're followed a few years later by Albanians and Turks. They all come as immigrant workers, as laborers, but they're really small pockets. To this day, we find few of them here and there. I have met a fourth, fifth generation Muslim from Cedar Rapids, Idaho. This is one of the earliest, uh, uh, Iowa, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, one of the earliest communities. Uh, was it fifth generation? I forgot. Uh, and I could not even tell that she was an immigrant. I mean, absolutely, she looked Caucasian to me. And she came and she says, uh, I want to you know, uh, learn about Islam. She wasn't practicing. I've talked about her story in Muhammad Faqih's Masjid in more detail. And the talk is online as well. Um, all of these pockets come here and there. Then in 1924, the American government felt threatened by the increased wave of immigrants. Not from Mexico. There's no threat in 1924 from Mexico. But rather, but rather from brown people. Not from India, Pakistan either. Who are they talking about? Not the Arabs either, too small. Actually yellow people to be more precise. The Chinese and the, and the Japanese. And so they pass an Immigration Act of 1924, also called the National Origins Act, also called the Asian Exclusion Act. Blatantly racist. Oops, sorry about that. Blatantly racist. No. Holes bar. It clearly says, we don't want anybody from these countries. Number one and two obviously are obviously China and all of these. But way down there, we are mentioned. We meaning India and all of these countries are mentioned as well. Turkey, Malaysia, Ceylon, all of these countries are Muslim countries are mentioned. So it says no immigrants, zero. Very racist act, blatantly so. This is 1920s. They don't really care about political correctness. And even, by the way, they were threatened by the Italians. So another clause limited the Italians. And they allowed French, British, Germans, and others to come in unlimited. But certain countries were limited, and other countries completely cut off. And mostly our countries were completely cut off. Still, Islam continued, as we said, through some immigrants here and there, through politicians who were coming here, through the local people. And in 1928, the Islamic Propagation Center of America opened in Brooklyn, New York, not too far from here under the leadership of somebody I would like to know more about, and I haven't found much material on him, Al-Sheikh Al-Hajj Dawood Ahmed Faisal. This person was from the Caribbean islands, probably originally, an, originally somehow an Arab. We don't know much about him. He immigrated as a Muslim. He's not a convert. He was a born Muslim, raised as a Muslim. He immigrated to America and started perhaps the first orthodox Islamic movement, never anywhere near as successful as the Nation of Islam or as anybody else, but he still started it nonetheless. And in the 1930s, 1940s, he became more and more successful. King Faisal of, uh, of, of Saudi Arabia, King Saud before him, King Khalid of Jordan, all of them, they, they gave him money to build a masjid, to propagate Islam. We have some of his letters here and there. We have some of his speeches. He lived a very, very, very long life. He died in 1980. 1980, even though he was active in 1920, 1930. He lived a very long life, and I have met many people who saw him, but as of yet, I have not read any biography, any book, any detailed uh, you know, things about who he was. And it does seem, and Allah Azza knows best, that his movement was not blessed with the depth and the level and the finances and the following of the other movements. But we should be aware that this person, who of course was a born Muslim, had gone for the Hajj, he was active in propagating what we call Orthodox Islam. He spoke out against the nation of Islam. He spoke out against the Qadianis. He was teaching and preaching what we call Orthodoxy. In 1957, we get to the last page, inshallah we're done. In 1957, the Islamic Center of Washington, D.C. opens, financed by many Muslim governments. Uh, and President 
Dwight Eisenhower himself comes to open the masjid. And he says, and this is way before any immigrants came, because this is still the Immigration Act. The main people praying in the masjid are African Americans and politicians. In other words, diplomats. President Eisenhower says, Under the American Constitution, this center, this place of worship, is as welcome as could be any similar edifice of any religion. Americans would fight with all of their strength for your right to have your own church, again he doesn't know masjid, for your own church and worship according to your own conscience, i.e. your own beliefs. This is the first official masjid opening. The president himself comes and this shows us the true American spirit, which we unfortunately sometimes have to remind those who think they are American. This is the actual American spirit. This act, Immigration Act, continued until 1965, when finally, and this is the generation of our fathers, literally, not forefathers, our fathers, in 1965, when finally it was appealed as being overtly racist and very bad for image, etc., etc., and it was appealed by a certain senator by the name of, or sorry, congressman by the name of, of, of Seller, but it was heavily supported by a person who's still alive, Senator Ted Kennedy. Senator Ted Kennedy did a lot to repeal this act and the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965 opened up the door pretty much for all citizens with quotas here and there. Uh, and priority was given once a person was able to come in, priority was given to his family members. So once you come in, family members included brothers and sisters and their children. So you could call your brother, your sister with the entire family associated with that sibling, etc., etc. And that was when the new wave of immigrants happened in the 60s, 70s, and of course in the 80s. And so in the early, uh, uh, late 50s, excuse me, the Federation of Islamic Association was formed in America and Canada, followed by in the early 60s, the MSA, the Muslim Student Association, and eventually in 1982, very recent, the Islamic Society of North America was founded as a general umbrella group. And now, of course, we have so many other groups and so many other things going on. Conclusion. Conclusion. I've zoomed over, especially the immigrants one, because this is the one that we're the most familiar with. Conclusion. We, especially the immigrants, need to realize that Islam was here way before we came. No doubt our presence has had a profound impact on it. And there is no doubt that much of the orthodoxization effect of the NOI was due to, of the Nation of Islam, was due to the immigrants and opening up the world to communication. All of this definitely has an impact. But we should never forget, we're not the only Muslims here. There are other Muslims of other ethnicities have been here before us. They were here pre-Columbus, maybe definitely contemporaneous to Columbus and post-Columbus as well. Islam has been here. What is different, and I'll conclude on this point and I'll continue inshallah tomorrow talking more about this. What is different in our situation for the first time, such a huge immigrant population has just come in one generation. Never before has that happened. All of them from different backgrounds and different nationalities, even from different theologies. The Sunni Shia split did not exist in America until the 60s, 70s when the immigrants came. All of the other splits within Sunni Islam, they came with the immigrants. We need to understand and contextualize where this came from. It came from us when we came. We brought a lot of our baggage with us. Some of it good, some of it bad. And a story that is in my own family and it's just profound to me. I never get over this story when I talk to my father. My father, I am proud to state, is one of the first Muslim immigrants to this country before even the 1965 act. He came in 1963 as a student on an exchange program by the US government. 1963. And he tells me that the first Jum'ah that they prayed in Houston, Texas, which is now one of the largest cities of America in terms of Muslim population, the first Jum'ah they prayed, he was the Imam and there were two people behind him in the city of Houston. And I have a picture that I grew up looking at because of these old you know, 70s pictures albums that they have. I have a picture of an Eid in 1971. And there are 13 people in the masjid. And a few months ago, alhamdulillah, I gave the Eid khutbah in the George R. Brown Convention Center, which is the largest convention center in Houston, to a packed audience of perhaps 15,000 just at that convention. And another 15,000 in various other places around Houston. And I said in that khutbah, my father gave the khutbah in Houston, in his generation, 
with three people attending. And in one generation, he was still in the audience right there listening to me. In one generation, there are over 30,000 Muslims praying Eid in Houston. That's food for thought. It's scary along with being optimistic. It's optimistic, we all know why. It's scary because that means a lot of things. It means a huge change overnight in one generation. We don't know, we're still a new community. We're still in our infancy. We haven't really thought through many things. We're still children, literally. Literally, we are children in terms of the immigrant population. We haven't really worked our, our way out, what we're going to do here. And that burden has been exacerbated by the events of 9-11 and the war on terror. All of these things, they're too mature for us to deal with as a community. But they've happened. We don't choose to deal with them. They've happened. We're going to have to think very deeply. We're going to have to really and truly situate ourselves if we want Islam to flourish in this land. It's been here bits and pieces. There were issues here and there. There were small groups. For the first time, Islam has become a national presence. National presence. Two days ago, Barack Obama standing here. Now, alhamdulillah, the audience is full of Muslims attending a lecture on the same podium. That something couldn't have happened 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 15 years ago. It's happening now. Things are changing. That represents a huge uh, slew of problems for us. And inshallah, I hope to discuss some of those problems ta'ala, in my lecture tomorrow. All I can do is discuss. We are still too immature intellectually, socially, Histor his, you, know, uh, you know, from a historical perspective to produce final answers. But what I want to do, like I've done today, is to make you start thinking, to make you start examining. And inshallah ta'ala together, of course, with the help of Allah before and during and after, we will persevere and make sure that our children grow up proud to be Muslim and proud to be American wherever they happen to be living. We want to give them the education that will make them successful in this world and the hereafter. وَآخْرُ دَعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمُ وَبَارَكَ عَبْدِ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ وصحبه أ